Hi everyone, uh, I'm Joey. I'm a second year computer systems engineering student and I'm here to talk to you a little bit about uh, assistance programming uh, specifically in Rust. Let me uh, give you a little bit of a scenario. So you've just got your uh, brand new Arduino Raspberry Pi microcontroller um, and you're really excited. What does anyone do with an Arduino? Uh, they blink LEDs. Uh, you just turn the LED on and off a few times a second. It's really exciting stuff. So you sat there thinking, OK, how do I do that? So you need some software. You need to put some software on your Arduino. And then you have this problem, C. Uh, most embedded software these days is written in C or C++ for a variety of reasons, mainly because um, historical. But um, you come across this problem, C, and then you have this problem and all the other class of uh, problems that come with writing code in C, C++, data races, undefined behavior, buffer overflows, massive security vulnerabilities, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and then you have this problem. This is you after writing code in C, the average C programmer. I love stock photos. Anyway, enter Rust. Rust is a systems programming language with um, a focus on secure performance and reliability. I'm not going to, I'm not going to try and like teach any rust here i'm just going to try and introduce the language and its application specific to this use case and um you'll kind of pick it up pick up the important bits as i go along if you if you don't know any rust but it achieves this performance and reliability through a variety of means firstly there's the design of its type system uh, it doesn't have any null types so you can't get any null pointer exceptions which instead prefers um option types which i'll talk about again in a bit uh, and immutability by default uh, the type system is inspired by functional languages such as Haskell. Uh, so for those of you more familiar with functional languages, uh, you'll pick up Rust, type, Rust and its type system quite quickly. Ownership rules ensure all data is owned by another bit of data which has responsibilities for its resources. So the whole concept of resource acquisition is initialization is enforced at compile time. Uh, lifetimes and borrow checking ensure all references are always valid. And all of this is done at compile time. Uh, and there's no runtime cost to any of this. And of course, a compile time error is 10 times better than a runtime error because it's an error you are told, like it's an error that you know you need to fix. So this is a, a good alternative to C, C++ because it provides similar efficiency and the level of low level control that you require from a systems language, but safely, because usually um, safe memory safe languages have like a garbage collector and then your ability to manage memory manually is just totally nerfed. The tooling and ecosystem surrounding Rust is so much more ergonomic than C, C++ stuff. For example, uh, package manager and build tool for Rust, Cargo, is uh, excellent in my opinion. And in other people's opinion too, the Stack Overflow developer survey, uh, Rust has come out as the most loved developer language for the sixth year in a row this year because it's such a pleasure to work with. Um, all of this makes it an excellent candidate for embedded development and lots of people agree. So there's a an excellent community working very hard to develop the ecosystem surrounding Rust for embedded devices. Libraries in Rust are called crates, and there's various crates providing different levels of abstraction and support for different microcontrollers and boards. So there's um, there's microarchitecture crates that handle routines and peripherals common to an architecture. They, they provide an interface to architecture-defined peripherals and handle any other routines common to specific instruction sets. The next layer of, of like abstraction building on that is a peripheral access crate, PACs. They're specific to each microcontroller and provide access to the peripherals on that device. They also provide a, a safe API over memory and register map peripherals. Uh, these crates can actually be auto-generated using a tool called SVD to Rust, and they generate the crate from an SVD file, which is a XML-like file which contains a description of a hardware device. Rust also has a crate called Embedded HAL. Um, embedded HAL provides a set of traits which are like type classes or interfaces for those more familiar with um, object-oriented languages that describe hardware interfaces such as GPIO, SPI, I2C, as well as providing generic interfaces for delays and clocks. So the idea is this, is that device drivers can write code using this Embedded HAL crate that's generic over these traits. And then to use the driver, you can just pass it a device that implements the embedded HAL traits. So how traits work is um, you have the behavior defined and then different types will implement that trait by defining the by implementing the specifics of the behavior. Uh, the driver will then do the rest for you. So how crates, which are how crates implement these traits on hardware specific peripherals in the pack and architecture crates to provide a concrete API which abstracts away any hardware details and gives a consistent interface no matter what hardware you're using and allows for easy access to I.O. 
Uh, board support packages just build on house by pre-configuring any board specific peripherals and map microcontroller pins to physical pin numbers to just make the interface a little bit easier. So that's kind of the different layers of abstraction for working with embedded devices in Rust. Uh, ideally, you want a board support crate when you're working with any hardware, but you can choose a HAL crate. Or if you're feeling really brave, you can work directly with packs and microarchitecture crates, but it's generally not recommended. BSP is typically quite small and can be put together yourself just by reading the documentation for the board you're wanting to work with. If you want to contribute to the community that's a great way to do that. Crates.io is a Rust package registry. It contains nearly 70,000 crates so if you're wanting to work with a peripheral chances are there's a driver for the, on there for it. If not again just write one yourself. The ecosystem is still relatively new compared to C, C++ stuff so lots of areas that need work. So an example of a device is uh, th this Arduino. It's a board I just happen to own. It has a um, ARM Cortex M0 based chip which has a, an excellent HAL and BSP available. Uh, the different crates there for the board are listed and they're how they build on each other and this is what I'm going to be using as an example. Uh, you can't run an OS on an Arduino like this, a bit of an asterisk next to that, you kind of can but I'm not going to. Uh, so we need to take into some account some differences when programming for this kind of environment. When you're programming for this you call, you're programming for what's called a bare metal environment. Uh, there's no operating system, your code is the only code that exists on that chip and there's a few differences we have to account for when writing Rust or, or any code really to run on a microcontroller. We have to write code specific to our hardware and much of that hardware specific stuff is taken care by those architecture and peripheral crates and that ecosystem I discussed earlier but um, we still can't just hit compile, um, there's a few things we need to take account of. First of all, we need to tell the compiler what architecture we're compiling for. So um, we need to cross compile. We also can't link to Rust standard library crate as it will make assumptions around the fact that we have an OS. Rust has a, a, a no standard attribute, which we can use in our code to tell the compiler not to link to its standard library. Instead, link to a subset of the standard library called the core crate. And um, that will provide, still provide most of the language items we need for putting together a minimal program. For this Arduino, there is a Cortex MRT crate which uh, provides um, some code to link into our binary to make sure the CPU is initialized properly. It also takes care of the memory layout of the program, populating the vector table as per the architecture specification so the CPU can operate as intended. The RT crate also provides a linker script. Uh, linkers are tools that combine all our compiled code into a single executable binary and linker scripts that tell them how to lay out the code to do this. We'll also need to provide our own linker script later for this hard, for this like board specifically to describe its memory layout. Something else we'll need is a panic handler. Uh, in Rust, when a program errors at runtime, it what does what's called panic and exits. In embedded systems, we'll need to define what happens to the CPU upon panic, which is what's done by a panic handler. Uh, one usually exists in a standard library crate, but as I've said, we can't link to that, so we'll need to define the behavior explicitly. I'll demonstrate how all this works with an example. And finally, we can get to blink our LED. I'm gonna live code this. Um, there's going to be quite a lot going on, so I'll explain it as I go. First thing we need to do is um, uh, we're going to use Cargo. Cargo is, as I mentioned earlier, Rust uh, package manager, build tool, general tool. Uh, Cargo new will generate a new project, LED blink. And that's created a new binary application called LED blink. So this is our default Cargo project. So it's got a basic main function git ignore and uh, a cargo.toml which is our like package manifest. Close all that for now. First thing we're going to do is add our dependencies. So we're going to depend directly on two crates. First of all is the board support package for this board Arduino Nano and also panic halt. That's our panic handler that we mentioned earlier. This will by default pull from crates.io but um, the version of this crate on crates.io is out of date, so I've, I've patched it manually and uh, I'm just going to link to it locally on my system for now. Next, we're going to need to, we've put the crates in our package manifest, but next we need to, we need to use them in our uh, main file. Now to import crates in Rust, we, uh, we use them. So we're going to use Arduino as our board support package and the board support package also re-exports the HAL. So we're going to use that directly as well. We're going to use panic halt in this slightly weird way. We're going to bind it to an underscore and by binding to an underscore, you don't actually bind it, but we're still kind of using it. And we need to do that so that it gets linked into the final binary, because if we don't link it, there's no panic handler and, and the compiler will complain. So we do this, we never call it, but it is there in the background. We also import the how prelude, which has uh, a few traits we'll need to use because you need to import traits to be able to use them. And um, this will come to in a second. Next step is to use that no standard attribute I mentioned earlier. So this 
tells Rust, oh, I need to, that's an underscore. That tells Rust not to link to the standard library crate. And then we're going to need another attribute called no main. Now, we can't use Rust default main interface like this because embedded reasons. So we have to tell Rust not to use fn main as our um, default entry point. We'll define this differently. So we'll use the entry macro here. So and then we'll write a new function, function to run to denoted with fn. We can call it literally anything we want because we're not using the main interface. And the function signature needs to look like this. This denotes a diverging function in Rust, which means it just doesn't ever return. And then you can define an infinite loop in Rust like this, just with the loop keyword. It's just a shortcut for while true. So we have a minimal main function here. Well, it's not main, an entry function. Loop indefinitely, as you can see. Thank you, Rust Analyzer. And yeah, that's that's the basics. We've got a skeleton here, so now we can have some actual code. We're going to need some peripherals from the microcontroller. Rust's ownership rules mean we have to have ownership of the peripherals if we want to use them. So we're going to assign them to some variables to take ownership of them. I'm just going to import the peripherals that we'll need and then assign them to some variables. Uh, the take fun so what we do here is we let peripherals equal peripherals take dot wrap. So we've got two sets of peripherals, the peripherals from the peripheral access crate and those from the microarchitecture crate that are defined by um, the Cortex-M architecture. You can see what we're doing here is we're taking them and then unwrapping them. So take means we, we take ownership of them and peripherals are modeled uh, singletons, meaning only one person can have ownership of them at a time. So if I were to now take it again, it wouldn't let me. And what the take function actually returns is it returns one of these option types. So when we have an option type, it's a kind of wrapper type that indicates that there might be an error returned by this function. And inside that option, we can then either have our peripherals or nothing. So kind of think of it as a box that may or may not be empty. And when we unwrap that our peripherals from the box, which returns them, um, we take our peripherals out. Or if we open the box and find it to be empty, Rust will panic. Hence why we need this panic handler. If we had, uh, if Rust was a language with nulls in it, then this this function might return either what we want or just not or null. So using an option forces us to explicitly handle the null case instead of leaving the program to null pointer exception or whatever. Usually unwrapping is considered bad practice, but there isn't anywhere else, any way else we can handle this error. So that's just what we're going to do. And if we can't take the peripherals anyway, something's gone very, very wrong and panic's probably the best option. So we've got our two sets of peripherals. Next, we need uh, to initialize and take ownership of the system clock. And we do this with, like this. Notice we've used a diff slightly different kind of variable binding here. These are immutable bindings because bindings are all immutable by default in Rust. So we let the peripherals equal, equal this. But the clock, we need, to, we need to mutate the clock, the clock peripheral. So we let mut clocks equal generic clock controller and then we initialize it to this internal function and we pass it some peripherals from uh, the chip and the how. Notice this um, and mut here, this is explicitly specifying that we're giving the clock initialization function a mutable reference. It's a kind of pointer that allows the owner of the reference to mutate the data. The reference is again immutable by default in Rust, but you can only have one mutable reference to an item at a time. Imagine you had more than one and they both tried to modify the same data, you'd have problems. And then we give that reference to the clock controller. Next, we need a, a delay device. So again, let mut delay equals delay new and we pass it some more peripherals and we also pass it the clocks we just initialized. So we've taken ownership of the peripherals, we gave the peripherals to the clocks, we gave the clocks to the delay. So we kind of have to take ownership of everything and then give the ownership to something else. So we now have ownership of an initialized delay device and that allows us to add delays between turning our LED on and off. Why is this giving me an error? Oh, because I've not imported it. Okay, apologies. Um, now, I know all this initialization seems like a faff, but it ensures that only we have ownership of our peripherals and not another thread, and it makes sure we don't do it twice. And all this makes for much safer code. All this modeling takes place at Rust in, in Rust type system and happens at compile time. So we can verify when we hit compile that this program is correct and won't error. So we have our delay, we have our clock, we have our peripherals, uh, we need a pin. We can import our few bits we'll need for GPIO. 
and then we can set up our pin for connecting to our LED. We take the pins from the board support package and we pass it the peripherals.port. Now the port peripheral on um, this chip is the peripheral that is connected to all the pins. So we pass that peripheral to this pins struct and the new function kind of takes it, splits it into all the individual pins for us to interface with it. So then we initialize our, initialize our LED with this function here. We initialize this using the into trait. So this just performs a conversion. This the into trait is part of Rust standard library because we define the type of the LED here. Pins are generic here. So they're modeled using these two um, types. They're modeled in the type system. So we can verify that the pin state is correct at compile time. So we give the state of the pin as a type and then cast it into that type and type check is telling me it's fine. So we're going to assume that the configuration is fine and, and it is. Um, so we have everything initialized and we can write our loop. Now we just want this to run infinitely. Delay, wait 200 seconds. We do 200 U8 because that's an unsigned 8-bit type in Rust. Um, wait 200 milliseconds, set high. Wait another 200 milliseconds, set low. Um, the unwraps are there because the set high function returns a result which is similar to an option type and it indicates that the it again indicates it might fail it can return either an okay value with our result wrapped in it or it can return an error value um, again so we're just unwrapping our result value from that it doesn't actually have anything in the result it's just saying yep this is okay if we try to unwrap an error the program will panic and exit again and again we shouldn't really unwrap it but there isn't any other way for us to handle this error so that is our our code done basically but uh, we're not quite finished we need to do a few other things to initialize the compiler and cargo to be able to uh, compile this for us so we need to create uh, a new folder called dot cargo it's going to have some cargo settings in it create a uh, config.toml it's just a few extra it's the place where we can put extra config and it's where we put the cross compilation target so target tells Rust comp the Rust compiler what architecture we're compiling for and we need to pass the compiler some extra flags as well these are linker arguments so the end magic argument is to account for the way the linker aligns program headers in memory to correct an issue with um LLD and Rust and the way these things interact. Then the tlinkx .x argument tells the linker to use a, a script called link.x, which is included with the RT I mentioned earlier. This linker script is specified as a dependency explicitly, but um, the RT crate is dependent on by our board support crate. We don't need to specify the RT crate in cargo.toml. We'll also need a memory dot x script in the root of our project these are used by the link the linker script so it describes the layout of memory for our specific device so it says that the flash originates here and is this long so we just move that forward a bit to account for eight kilobytes of bootloader on the arduino and then it also tells the linker that we have um, this much ram i can't actually remember how much that is so with all of this in place we can we can compile the code now do cargo build that's our build command and we'll do it in release mode because we don't want any debug symbols in there sorry just give it a second the ROS compiler can be slow sometimes by sometimes I mean all the time okay let me find my working version of this really quickly okay our, our code is now compiled and working <laughs> So we can then use another command to copy the binary from an ELF format executable into something that can be loaded on our Arduino. There we go. So Rust object copy is a is a command. It's a bin util that copies the ELF executable to um, a binary executable that we can load onto our Arduino. And then if I can load the code onto the Arduino, in fact, We've run out of time. I'm not going to load the code onto the Arduino, but uh, it does load. I can promise you because I've done it before. Because here is a GIF of it working. So that's what it looks like when it's done. Uh, thank you. That's all I've got time for. Apologies that I went a bit pear shaped at the end. Um, code is available at that repo, um, and it is 
very easy to add drivers to other devices and build on that simple example. I know it kind of took a while to get there because there's a few bits we need to uh, I need to account for, but from there it's kind of quite simple to go and there is templates you can use for setting up repos for embedded development. Any questions? By all means. And then um, if you want to learn more, I've got loads of resources. Feel free to ask. Thank you.